All right, hello everybody. Welcome to USA at our home at Heifer Ranch in Perryville, Arkansas. My name is Tyler Pearson and I'll be hosting today's live stream. I'm joined by my amazing colleague, Christine Hernandez, and a couple of hundred of our friends in the background that you can see here. We've got an amazing show uh, planned for you today. We've got a lot of information to cover and I'm just gonna give you a quick intro to some of the ground rules and just what, what, what we're gonna be talking about. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Christine to get started with all the information that we're going to share. So a ton of value in today's video. So thanks for sticking around. Thanks for joining us. If you have questions along the way, you want to know something more about what we're showing you, or if you want to tell us about something you're doing, we would love to hear from you. This is all about community and you're a part of it. So thanks for being here and feel free to comment in the live chat and I'll be monitoring your questions here and relaying those to Christine as much as we can. So what are we going to talk about today? grass-fed sheep, how to raise sheep out on pasture. You can see behind me our flock of sheep hanging out with us, so we're gonna be checking out them and talking about them. We're gonna look at infrastructure and equipment. We're gonna be talking about rotational grazing, forage quality, what you wanna feed uh, your sheep. We're going to be looking at parasites, health, how to maintain optimal health for your herd breeding and lambing and stick around until the end because we're going to show you a special video that we put together all about how Christine processes the lambs after they're born out in the field step by step. So it's a lot of information we've condensed down into a short little video we're going to play right here during the live stream. So stay tuned for that and if you have any questions like I said just put them in the live chat and we will get to them. I'm going to turn it over to Christine. She's going to tell you a little bit about our operation here at Heifer Ranch and then dive right into infrastructure. So, Christine, how's it going? Wonderful. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today is a much more beautiful day than it would have been yesterday. It was cloudy and rainy, so we get the sun and 70 degree weather today. Um, also, stay tuned until the end because I raided my bookshelves and I wanted to show you some resources that I use often uh, when dealing with our sheep enterprise. So I will show you those at the end of this live stream here. Um, but to get started, behind me you can see all of our sheep. We have Katahdin hair sheep, and so we just raise them for meat here at the ranch, and then we use them in our multi-species grazing throughout all of our pastures. We have 116 ewes that were exposed to our rams this year, and currently we have about a week left in our lambing season. So about 90% of our lambs have already been born. We have 155 lambs out here on pasture with us, um, grazing and nursing off their moms and uh, getting used to how we do things around here. And then we also have three rams that are not with the flock. They hang out in their bachelor pad until it's breeding season. We have two Katahdin rams and then we have one white dorper ram. Um, so a little bit about our sheep flock. So like I said, they are 100% grass fed. So they are out on pasture all year long, no matter what the weather is. Um, we like to give them, you know, fresh grass. We move them every day or two. We make sure that they always have shelter in their pasture, um, fresh water and everything like that. But Katahdins are special to us here because the Katahdin breed originated here in the United States. They started getting developed back in the 1950s by a gentleman up in Maine, and he imported hair sheep from the Virgin Islands, and he did a ton of breeding and selection with wool sheep and hair sheep because he wanted to get the hair sheep that you don't have to shear. They will shed their hair in the springtime. You can see some of them are doing that now. Um, and then they want, he wanted to mix that with the wool breed so that we can get the, the good, fast-growing lambs. So it took him 20 years to develop the Katahdins. And in the 1980s, Heifer realized that the Katahdin breed would do great in our southern climate here in Arkansas. And so we actually started getting stock from that original group of Katahdins that were being created. And so we have had Katahdin sheep here since the 1980s, and we are still going strong. Um, so this year we actually took one, we purchased one Dorper ram and we bred him with one third of our Katahdin ewes. The reason why we incorporated the Dorper is because they are well known um, also for their hardiness, you know, they're very prolific and they, have really good weaning weights and grow out, grow out weights. 
Um, and so we just wanted to add that to our lambs and see if we can get bigger lambs a little bit faster um, this year. So we will keep you posted on how that is going so far, so good. Okay, I'm yeah. gonna hop in here real quick and just say hey to some of our audience. I just wanna say hey to Russ Dean from Jackson uh, County, West Virginia, Pam Corcoran from Custer, Wisconsin. Hey to Linda Percy from Southern New Jersey. Let's see, we got quite a few folks. Susan Bigler, hey Susan, welcome back to the ranch. Glad you're joining us. Uh, Joanne Stenar from Grand Folks, North Dakota. So many more tuning in. And if you're just joining us, we're live from Heifer Ranch in Perryville, Arkansas, talking all about grass-fed sheep today in our operation here. And we, if you have any questions, just type them in the live chat and we will do our best to answer them. It's all about community and we wanna learn and grow with you. So we're gonna now show you <laughs> uh, just just one of our friends who's just hanging out for the day just seeing what's going on he says uh, guys talk about infrastructure T tell them about how, how you keep me in a fence she she sorry it's a girl it's okay. <laughs> oh yeah yellow i ear will tag. tell you how we know that here in a little bit you're gonna eat my earphones <laughs> okay all right so infrastructure so as i was saying our sheep are out on pasture all year long and we try and uh, we move them every one to two days and so to do that we use a lot of temporary fencing what we're doing right now is we are moving our sheep flock behind our cattle and so the cattle require less fencing than a sheep would but we use a lot of poly wire fencing here at the ranch. And so we use temporary poly posts and then poly braid wire. And I just set up a short fence here to demonstrate to you. Um, we were able to train our sheep to just stay behind two electric wires. Um, some people think that, you know, sheep won't stay in any electric fence. Well, that can be true. You just have to train your sheep to the system that you want to use. And so for us, the poly wire works fantastic as long as it's hot and it's at the proper height. So our sheep, like I said, are just trained to, to stay behind two wires. A lot of our pasture fencing for the perimeters is barbed wire. Um, and with that said, if a sheep is hungry, you can't keep a sheep in. You know, if you don't move them in time, they will gladly let themselves out and move to a new pasture without you. And if they go through that barbed wire fence, they're gonna leave some of their hair, some of their wool behind. And that just leaves a nice, this is the exit sign for all the other sheep to follow. So making sure you move your sheep to, to fresh grass on time, you know, don't let them get too hungry. Sheep are very busy grazers. Um, then they should respect whatever type of fencing you have. I know some sheep producers that use the electric netting, um, the temporary electric netting like we use in our turkeys. If you want to see that, you can check out our turkey production video. Um, our sheep are not trained to that, and so we've had a few bad experiences with that electric netting, but um, two strands of poly wire work just fine for us. What are the other components you got here? So uh, to get our poly wire hot, we use a solar charger. Uh, this brand is a stay fix. There's other um, wonderful solar charger brands out there. You just need to make sure that your charger is strong enough to power all the fencing that you need. Um, and then we have it connected to a grounding rod to make sure that there's a good ground going through so your fence is nice and hot. Um, and then to test your fence, ooh, um, to test your fence, we just have a Gallagher fault finder, which is very helpful helpful for us because once you put that on your fence, it'll tell you the voltage, and then if there is a ground in your fence at all, it'll tell you in which direction to go and find that. So that is what we use for our fencing. Um, it's nice and quick and easy to set up and take down. This is multi-species, so we can use it for cattle and pigs and sheep, um, everything here at the ranch. Okay, uh, we got our first question coming in Great. from Dustin Crystal. Wants to know about why Katahdin sheep. What's the big difference between them and maybe uh, St. Croix? Sure. So the Katahdin sheep, they're hair sheep. So like I said, we don't have to shear them. Um, they shed their hair in, in the springtime. Uh, Katahdins are well known to be parasite resistant. And we actually worked with the USDA uh, here in Arkansas a number of years back to help... Um, you know, help 
with some of that research, taking fecal samples and things like that. So parasite resistance is a really big one. Um, they are heat tolerant as well. I mean, our summers here in Arkansas can get up into the hundreds with some heat index. So just having sheep that are tolerant to the heat and that can handle that is really important for us too. Um, they have good mothering abilities. They have a really high flocking instinct. Um, and these sheep, I mean, they've been here for a long time, so they know us, they're really easy for us to handle and work with. Cool. That's a that, good question. Yeah. There's lots of different breeds. The breed that you want to raise is going to depend on what you want to do with your sheep, like what type of enterprise you want to have. Get your hat like that. Yep. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, and so, got another question from upstate New York. They want to know if we sell any of our breeding stock. Uh, currently, no, we haven't sold any of our breeding stock. That's not a bad idea. Um, so, possibly in the future. Um, we do call some animals every year. You know, we take a certain percentage of the females that might not be producing as, as highly as, as we would like them to. And so we're going to try and keep our sheep flock, you know, around a 125 ewes or so. Okay, awesome. Great question uh, from upstate New York, Fidel Sukumar. Thank you so much. And okay, so we talked about temporary fencing. What, what other kind of fencing might you use? Permanent? Oh yeah, so with the permanent, like I said, we have the barbed wire. Um, if you have, you know, s some pasture where you your sheep can not get out, like you're close to town or something like that, and you want something really strong that your sheep is going to stay in, I would recommend using um, like your hard field fence wire. Um, the sheep shouldn't be able to get out of there, um, but yeah. Okay, and did you talk about the height of the, the lines here? Um, yeah, I don't know the, the inches wise. Um, I just go by the notches on our poly post, so notch four and notch six. I mean, that's maybe like 14 inches off the ground and mm -hmm. then maybe 24 inches off the ground. Um, and then since we are moving our sheep so often, we're using that temporary fence. We also use temporary waterers. Um, and so this is just a, an old 55 gallon barrel that we cut down and then we inserted a Joby valve into it and it just hooks up to our regular garden hose and we can hook that up to a hydrant or into one of our quick connects. Um, and then this yellow float valve, what it does is that once the water gets to a certain height, which is determined by that rope on there, that will shut the water off. And so when the sheep come and drink, you know, this float's gonna go down a little bit that allows the water to turn back on. So they have a constant supply of fresh water. Um, and then these are very easy to tote around and move to the different pastures we're going to. Okay. Uh, we got one more question coming in about infrastructure. Guys, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna mention our corral system, but we're also gonna refer you to another video where if you wanna learn about that. And then we're gonna start talking about grazing, rotational, uh, rotational grazing and forage quality. So if you got any more infrastructure questions, get them in now and we'll try to get to them before we jump on to the next topic. And the question was actually coming all the way from Zambia. Um, where's the commenter? Okay, so Nelson Niato asked, do we supplement with hay for our sheep? That's a great question. Um, here at the ranch, we have tried giving our sheep hay um, they would rather eat grass than eat the hay. And that's even true in the winter time. So we do have some fescue and some cover crops that we plant so that the cattle and the sheep can still graze and have that excellent forage in the winter time. Um, but they would prefer to go out and eat rather than eat grass rather than eat hay. Um, this past year, the only time that they ate hay was during the snowstorm. We had about 12 inches of snow on the ground. And so they ate hay for a couple of days until that snow started melting and they were able to paw some of that snow out of the way and, and get to the grass. Awesome. And then a follow-up question from uh, Dustin Crystal again about uh, this waterer. So uh, how do you connect it? Where's your water source and how do you actually get water to it? Yeah, okay. I mean, I'll show you, I know you showed the quick connect, but I guess yeah. do you run water lines through the pastures? So um, all of our pastures have some sort of water connect in them, whether that's a frost-free hydrant at one end or the other. 
Um, the pastures that we raise our poultry in, they have water lines underground and we have quick connects about every 150 feet or so. Um, so depending on, on where the sheep are at in the pasture, if we're giving them the whole thing or dividing it up with our poly fence, you know, we may just have to run um, a few hoses to get the water to them, or we will start the sheep at the end where our water source is and then move them to a new section so they can always get back to the water, if, if that yeah, makes sense. No, I think that's okay. a great answer. Uh, so William Roberts, I see you're asking about the taste of the sheep versus maybe a, a hair sheep or a wool sheep. And I think that's probably gonna be, you know, subjective. And But I think our sheep taste pretty great. I've had several of them. You can get them from grassrootscoop.com. Sorry, the sheep are uh, causing a, a wreck over there. Um, you can get, actually buy our sheep here. If you're in the United States, the continental U.S., you can have uh, these products that we raise here at Heifer Ranch delivered right to your door through grassrootscoop.com. Uh, that's where we sell all, all of our products. We'll get a link in the chat. Hey, somebody wants to say hey. <laughs> we got a curious one. That's Rosie. Hey, Rosie. Okay. All right. Don't don't get don't <laughs> don't smudge my camera now. <laughs> <laughs> She's hungry, so we should probably talk about forage a little bit and how we rotationally graze these sheep. Sure. Okay, so um, as I said earlier, we are following our sheep flock. Our, our sheep flock is following our cattle herd. Okay, so any pasture that they're, that they're in, the cattle will have been in there previous. And so cattle really like to eat grass, and so they need longer grass because they use their tongue, you know, to, to wrap around that grass and pull it and that's how they they get that forage. But sheep, they are very busy grazers. They love to eat and walk all at the same time. Um, their mouths are very movable and so they can be picky eaters. Not picky in what they eat, but they can go out there, you know, and get the smaller leaves uh, than a cattle, than a cow would be able to. So sheep are very excellent grazers. They thrive on having multiple different species of forage out there. You know, we don't want a monoculture of forage. They like the forbs, where a lot of people would consider those to be weeds, but that would be like curly dock and vetch and, and clover and things like that. Um, they will eat cockleburr and they will eat ragweed. You know, um, those are excellent forages for our sheep. So they help take care of any like weed, weed problem that we would have. Got any examples you want to show? I did some foraging earlier today. Okay. They're a little wilted, but... It's all right. You can just leave them there and... Yeah. So this Put is, them in the sunlight there if you can. This is an example of the curly dock I was talking about. Um, this is a nice broad leaf. Um, some people say that there's some anti-parasitic properties to them, but they grow in, in a bunch and produce really nice big broad leaves like this. Um, my favorite forage would be hairy vetch that comes up in the springtime, and that's this one here. Um, it all connects to one root in the soil and produces these, these long arms with all these little leaves on them. Um, produces a really beautiful purple flower, but the sheep absolutely love this, and this is called vetch. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, of course, clover. Um, we have a ton of clover coming up. You always see that in the springtime. We have the, the crimson clover. One thing that you need to be cautious about with any ruminant is putting them out onto a, a large stand that is primarily clover. Um, they can get bloat from that, which would just be they're producing too much gas in their rumen and they can't um, expel that and then they could possibly um, die from bloat. So you need to be very careful putting sheep on large amounts of clover. Okay, we got a question coming in uh, from Cat Girl. She wants to know how long before the sheep can be rotated back to a field. So we are, get, that's gonna depend on the time of year. Uh, right now in our rotational grazing plan, our management plan, we are giving all of our pastures 30 day rest before they go back to that. Um, in the winter time, of course, that's going to need to be a little bit longer, and you really need to look at the grass. Your grass and your forage will tell you if it's ready to be grazed again. Um, so, for example, you know, if you go out there, the sheep are going to eat the tips of the grass off. Okay, so it's going to look like that. The little bite marks there. Your grass is ready to be grazed once those tips grow back. Um, you shouldn't put any animals back on there before those 
those tips are exposed. Awesome. Okay. Uh, one question from Brittany Abriel wants to know when do we typically uh, sell our lambs for meat? So I guess for us is when, when do we take them to processing? Yeah. So we are looking more for a weight rather than, than an age. So if you are producing lamb, by the USDA standards, a lamb is less than a year old. So we will have all of our lamb processed before they're 12 months of age, but we want them to hit a target weight so that we can get the most out of that carcass. Um, we are shooting for about 100 to 120 pound lamb. Um, we, and that is why we introduced the Dorper genetics this year to see if we can get to that weight you know, a little bit sooner, around like eight or nine months old. Awesome, cool, great question. All right, uh, what else we got about grazing and forages? How they graze? Um, I kind of talked about that. You know, they're going to go out there with their mouths. They're going to use their teeth, and they're able to, to get a lot closer to the ground. So you need to make sure that, that your sheep are not overgrazing an area because they do like to graze with their nose to the ground. Um, and you may be out in your pasture. And I would recommend, you know, go look at your pasture before you put your sheep in there see what forage is available, watch your sheep graze a little bit, and then after you move them out, go and see what it is that they ate. But you can't just stand here and look and say, oh my gosh, there's so much green grass, look at all those nice clumps of bright green forage. There may be a reason why they're not going out there and eating some of that forage. So the sheep are not going to graze around their own manure piles, and so they may leave a beautiful clump of clover, but there may be, you know, some feces within and just underneath that clump. So, you know, go out and really pay attention to your forages, pay attention to your sheep. Your sheep will tell you when they're hungry and red when they're ready to go. Awesome, great. And I guess the, let me jump in here real quick and say hey to everybody who's just now joining us. If you're uh, stopping in on the live stream, we're coming to you live from the pastures at Heifer Ranch talking all about how we raise grass-fed sheep here at the ranch. And if you got any questions, just pop them in the comments and we will answer them for you or try to. If you have any tips or tricks that you think we should know about, we would love to hear about them. And I'm going to turn it back over to Christine. I think we're going to talk a little bit more about... Um, about grazing, specifically maybe about stocking densities. We want to talk a little sure. bit about stocking densities. Yeah. And then we're going to hop on over to talk more about parasites and deworming and just overall health of your flock. And stay tuned until the end. We got some of the best stuff coming up for the last. We've got a really great video we're going to show you all about field processing lambs. And we're going to be talking about our livestock guardian dogs as well. Uh, Uno and Sam, and they are out here. They look like sheep, so it's kind of hard to find them, but we will find them and go hang out with them and get a little closer to the flock. Um, so, um, stocking densities. Stocking density. Yeah. Yes, okay, so right now we are, you know, trying to calculate how long our sheep flock can stay in a certain pasture based on, you know, the number of acres. But it's also, you need to look at how many animals you're going to put on that, that plot of land. And so right now, since our ewes have lambs on them, we are actually using what's called a, a body unit. And so it's a, or animal unit. So it's a thousand pounds is one animal unit. And so with our ewes that have lambs, that would be three ewes and her lambs, we would count as one animal unit. And then when the ewes are dry or when the lambs are weaned and not nursing, uh, it would be about five sheep is one animal unit. Um, and then also, you know, they will tell you when they're ready to go. You can look at the sheep and you can kind of tell if their rumens are full or not. So for ruminants, their rumen is on their left hand side and that's where they're going to be um, like breaking down that grass and fermenting it. Um, that's where all those microbes are. And so if you look at their left hand side, you know, if that's nice and, and full, then their rumen is full. I mean, they're, they're happy, they're satisfied. If they're out there laying down and chewing their cud, they're ruminating. Um, if that left-hand side is sunken in at all, that means that their rumen isn't as full as it could be. And so they're gonna need a little bit more forage. Um, when we are ready to move our sheep to a new pasture, sometimes that would be a, an adjacent pasture, sometimes we have to go down the road, uh, we can simply just stand at the gate and call them. We just say, come on sheep, and we say that a couple times, you know, get everyone's attention, and they will follow us to where we need to go. We usually have one or two people in the back 
pushing up the stragglers. Um, and that's probably one of the most stressful times is, you know, moving that sheep flock with the new lambs the first one or two times until they really get the hang of it. But our lambs, some of our lambs are a month and a half old. And the last few moves that we've done, it's been those lambs that have been leading the rest of the flock to a new pasture. So they are really getting the hang of our system and are doing a great job. Awesome. Okay, we got a great question coming in from Bale Skills, Eldag Machinery. Wants to know about the weaning age and weight. Sure. Um, so I'm going to kind of play with that a little bit this year. We are going to wean at some point this summer. It's going to depend on our forage, but probably about five months old. And the ewes will also start kind of weaning them off as well, you know, doing some self weaning. Um, when we wean the lambs, what we're going to do is we are going to put all the lambs that we'll be selling to the Grassroots Farmers Cooperative in with our stockers so they can be ahead of everybody. So they can get that really good forage and those cover crops. And then we'll take all of our ewes, you know, and put them on the, the pastures that aren't as, as full of forage and things like that. You know, they just need to maintain their body condition until breeding time so they can be on the, the less, um, nutritious forage. Okay, great answer, great question. Um, we grabbed the Formacha card and we can walk over there for the parasites and health portion yes. just so we can observe the sheep a little bit while we talk about it. All right guys, so we are gonna get ready to talk about uh, parasites, deworming, health of the flock. We're gonna get a little closer to the flock so you can see uh, just how they're doing while we're talking about their uh, health. And if you got any more final questions, you know about rotational grazing, or the infrastructure, uh, forage health, you know, we get them in now and we can do our best to answer them. But these guys are curious to know what's going on. All right. Okay. <clears throat> So whenever you think about health and sheep, you know, a lot of people are probably... Oh, somebody just, somebody just realized we're here, sleeping on the job. It's okay, Uno. <laughs> um, so the number one health concern for sheep is intestinal parasites. Um, and like I said before, that's one of the reasons why we have katahdins. You know, they show some high parasite resistance and some resilience. Um, so I wanted to show you a FAMACHA card, and so you have to go through through training to get one of these, but um, this is called a FAMACHA card, and you can use this to look at the lower inner eyelid membrane of a sheep or a goat, and it will tell you, you know, or give you an idea of if they are anemic or not. You want them to be at one, which is nice and bright red. Um, if they are pale, you know, a four or a five, um, those are going to be some animals that you may need to think about using some dewormer on. Um, if we have to deworm any of our sheep, they go on our list to get rid of because once you deworm a sheep, the parasites that are within that sheep, you know, you are going to kill some off, yes, but then the ones that survive are going to start developing some resistance to that dewormer. And that is a huge issue with, um, dewormers right now for small ruminants, so with sheep and goats, is that some of them are, you know, the parasites within them are resistant to all the dewormers that we currently have available on the market. Um, so we do our best to not have to deworm anything here. Um, and if we do, like I said, you know, we get rid of that sheep. And some things that you can do as management, you know, to help with your parasite load would be rotational grazing. So don't let those sheep, you know, get down to the last few inches of grass in your pasture. That's where all of the parasite larvae are going to be living. Um, so keeping them rotating to fresh pasture, don't let them come back until that grass, you know, is six or eight inches tall. Um, doing body condition scores, checking their famacha and things like that, um, making sure that, that, that they have good forage, that they have salt and mineral, and really just helping keep them healthy and stress-free will help with your parasite loads. So how do you do a body condition score? A body condition score, so with sheep, you would give them a score of a one to a five. Um, one being emaciated and five being obese. And so you, you take the palm of your hand and you're gonna feel 
down along their spine and along their hips and along their ribs. Um, and then you just associate a certain number with that. We like our sheep to be at a three or a four. Um, during this lambing, you know, and while they're nursing, if they're nursing, you know, really big twins, it's not uncommon for them to drop a body condition score. And it's after they wean those lambs off that they'll be able to put that body condition score back on. So I I'm not concerned if one of our sheep, you know, gets down to a body condition score of two. Um, they just need, you know, some, some better forage and, and salt and mineral and things like that. So, and they can bounce right back after that. Okay, a uh, great question from William Roberts said, uh, w but this is, uh, I think, back about forages maybe. Which forbs do you seed for parasite control? Um, so, uh, Lespedeza is a really good one. There's a ton of research out there that Lespedeza can help with, um, you know, it's a, a natural parasitic. Um, like I said, the curly dock. I think bird's foot trefoil is also with one of those um, anti-parasitic forages. But like I said, just keeping them moving, keep them, keeping them on fresh grass, you know, don't let them eat around their, their manure. So that's even true with like their salt and mineral. I like to keep that nice and cleaned out. They may step in there and get some manure from their hooves in their salt and mineral. I make sure to take any of those pellets or any of that fecal matter out so that they don't have to come into contact with that because that's where, you know, your your parasite eggs are going to be in that manure um, and then the larvae is going to be on the grass. And parasites is a huge topic. Um, I mean, we could talk days for that. <laughs> I, I got my master's degree in parasitology of small ruminants. So, I mean, that, that's another topic that we can come back on and do a whole, whole thing. Okay. It's a lot of information. Well, we do have a question about the Fumacha card, so let's yes. get to that one. Um, Bale Skills uh, Machinery asking about how you check the eyelid color. Is it a visual check, or do you have to get really close and handle them? Yes. So you have to, you know, put your hands on every sheep. Um, it's best to do it outside on a nice sunny day. You don't want to do it in a barn or if it's cloudy outside. Um, so you will, you would catch the ewe, um, you know have her head in your hands and then you physically need to open up her eye and pull down that that lower eyelid and pop out that membrane a little bit in the sun there yeah there you go and then it's nice if you need to have this card in your hand so you can compare you know what color it is once you've done it a lot um i mean i can do a famacha score without having this card just because i've done it so many times and i know what those those colors are but yes you do have to handle every sheep in order to get a proper Fumacha reading off of there. And that's where like a, a corral system or some sort of catch pen would come in handy. Um, whether you use, you know, panels and T-posts, you need a, a spot to, to corral them so that you can, you can handle them. Cool. Great question. Thanks so much, Bale Skills. And I see you got some other stuff here. You want to yeah. talk about these? Um, so another uh, health thing with sheep would be that if they start to limp, so if they are getting like foot rot or foot scald. Um, the last few years, we have started not trimming our sheep hooves unless they are showing us that they need them to be trimmed. We used to pull the sheep flock into the corral once a year and trim everyone's hooves. But then that kind of is going to put a mask on if someone is having hoof issues. And if we do have sheep that are having hoof issues constantly, you know, we will take her out of our flock. Um, so we just trim hooves on those that are starting to, to limp or maybe having excess growth. If they eat grain, our sheep just eat grass, but you know, if your sheep or goats are eating grain, then their hooves are gonna grow a little bit faster. Um, so just get yourselves a good pair of hoof trimmers. You know, just get those at Tractor Supply or a local farm store. Um, make sure you keep them nice and sharp. Um, so trimming hooves and if you are getting like hoof scald or hoof rot, um, we have copper sulfate that you just mix with water and you dissolve the crystals. You know, you can put it into a spray bottle and spray her hoof with it. That will help um, kill that bacteria and harden the hoof again. Or um, something that we started doing a few years ago is dissolving the copper sulfate in a rubber boot and then putting her foot in there and letting her stand in the boot for about 30 seconds to a minute. Um, it's a lot easier than trying to, to spray her or put her in a bucket or something like that. 
Awesome. Okay. Hey, I uh, just want to jump in real quick and say uh, thanks so much for sticking with us. We got a little bit more to talk about. We're going to talk about um, breeding and lambing. We've got a really cool video we're going to show you here in just a minute. We're going to talk about livestock guardian dogs. If you got any more questions about you know overall health and parasites, feel free to get them in. And if you're finding value in this video, if you're enjoying what you're seeing, do us a big favor and hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. It'll help us reach more people on YouTube so we can continue to do live streams just like this and make more great videos all about regenerative agriculture. And that would be awesome if you'd help us out with that. And if you've got any more questions, get them in. So turn it back over and anything else about parasites and health or you want to jump into breeding and lambing? Um, and so with, with parasites and health and even lamb in itself the number one thing that you need to do is to spend time with your sheep flock make sure that you're observing them we observe our sheep flock twice a day during lambing we may come out here more just to make sure that no one's having any lambing issues but you know observing your flock picking up on anyone that may be starting to limp or you know the last 10 percent of your flock that's moving through the gate or to that new pasture, keep an eye on, on that last 10% because maybe those are the ones that are a little bit slow, maybe they're not feeling good. Um, so yeah, just um, high observation skills will help you pick up on a lot of, of issues. Why don't we go do some observing real quick, just take okay. a look at them sure. and we'll start talking about lambing. I got one question, Okay. Uh, but I know People would love to see them up a little bit closer. Yeah. So if we can do that without scaring them away too much. It's okay guys and gals and kids. So, um, so we do oh, have man. a question real quick. Okay. Um, Russ Dean asked if you have problems with coyotes, <laughs> bears uh, or whatever for sheep and maybe now's a, and he's a good time to introduce this fellow. Yes. Okay, so this girl over here, this is Uno. She's one of our livestock guardian dogs. We also have one other one, Sam. He's out here somewhere. Um, they are specific for our sheep flock. They stay with our sheep flock all the time. Um, but we can talk about guardian dogs maybe at the end here. Um, but yes, that is Uno. Our number one predator would be coyotes and domestic dogs. We haven't had any issues with bears. Um, or anything like that, so. Okay, cool. Well, they seem to be a little camera shy anytime we get a little close, but if you wanna go ahead and jump into lambing. Yeah, um, so thinking about lambing, you need to know when you want to lamb. So we always lamb in the springtime. There are some producers that, that will lamb in the fall. That all depends on your market and when you're going to be selling that, that lamb, if you're selling lamb for meat. Um, so you need to think about when you want to lamb, and then that's gonna take you back to when you need to start breeding. And so sheep have a gestation of five months, roughly 147 days. And so you want to put your ram in with your ewes 147 days prior to your first day of lambing. Um, so we have three rams that we use here. And so we will separate our sheep flock up into three different groups and then put a ram with each group. Um, and to do that, so we have a harness that we'll put on our rams with a, a crayon, and we get these from Premier One. Um, so each ram will have a harness on, and then when he mounts the ewes and comes down, he will leave a mark um, just above their tail head. And that is how we know that that sheep has been bred, and we can mark that down on our records. Um, so. So this is the harness This here. is, yes, this is the harness. It will go on the ram's chest. Um, you know, it gets clipped on over his back. And then this is the crayon. Uh, they have a bunch of different color options. We use three different colors. So for example, we will start with the color red. Um, this will stay on him for 17 days because a use um, will go into heat every 17 days. And so at the end of that first 17 days, then we will change to a different color, for example, blue. Um, so if someone, if one of the ewes was marked red and then marked blue, that means that she didn't conceive during her first heat cycle. And so hopefully she conceived during that second one. Um, if she doesn't you know, get marked with the third color, say green, then she got bred during that, that second heat cycle. 
And that just gives us a good idea of how long our lambing window is going to be, you know, when we would expect most of our lambs to, to hit the ground. Okay, we got one good question. I know you probably got more to say, but Ruth Tabor asked about what is your lambing percentage on grass? Yeah, um, so we are aiming for about 150% um, lambing percentage. So we want all of our older ewes, you know, to give us twins, our maiden ewes, so those ones that this is their first time lambing. We would expect singles, you know, twins are okay, but singles are a little bit better because it's her first time around, you know, she's learning, she's learning the ropes. So 150% to 180% is good. Okay. Let's see. Um, so we talked about the the, the harness. Um, talked about cycles a little bit. Breeding overview. Yeah. Um, we got the lambing kit here, but maybe now would be a good time to show the video. You think, or you got something else? Yeah. Um, well, I guess just real quick. So okay. in the video, I think you will see that we do some paint branding, um, and so we paint brand our use prior to lambing when they get their vaccination. So we vaccinate are used for with CD&T four weeks prior to the first lamb. Um, and then we will paint their ear tag number on their side. Um, and so these are just brands in the shape of numbers. This one I wanted to show you because this is a homemade one. This is just made out of some rebar. So it's easy uh, for someone to do, but we did this in oil-based paint and we'll paint the used number on her side so that we can easily know who she is um, out on pasture since we won't have them you know in in close confinement cool all right um so i think uh, somebody just subscribed to the channel and you got a cool subscriber notification got some cool little things plugged into the screen there glad that's working out so if you want to see a cow or some flowers jump on the screen with your name on it just hit that subscribe button <laughs> um, so now we are going to show you guys a short six minute video that we put together all about uh, how we process the newborn lambs after they're born. Anything you want to say about the video before we before we set it up? Um, no, I don't think so. We go pretty in depth with everything that we do. Um, you know, if you have a question during that video, you know, keep it in mind or type it in the chat. I have my lambing kit out here with me so I can pull anything out and, and show it to you after you see that video. Cool. All right, we're going to play that video right now, so enjoy it and stick around because we're still going to talk about marketing and sales and our livestock guardian dog. So check out this video. First, let's go over our lambing record sheet. The important information we record at birth includes the ewe's ear tag number, the lamb's assigned ear tag number, date of birth, sex, birth weight, and breed. We also use check boxes to ensure we don't miss any of these steps in the lambing process. Observing the lamb nursing from the ewe, checking the lamb's navel in a fine iodine, castrating the lamb if it's a male, and paint branding the ewe's number. In my field kit, I keep ear tags, ear tag applicator, elastrator, elastrator bands, iodine in a spray bottle or a container, dull scissors, a sling, a digital scale, spray paint, and extra pins, OB lube, OB sleeves, latex gloves, towels, and a shepherd's crook. We field process and collect data on our lambs when they are less than 24 hours of age. If we wait any longer, the lambs are very difficult to catch. It's important to leave enough time between lambing and processing for lambs to dry off, start nursing, and develop a strong bond to their ewe. The ear tag system we use in our flock requires custom ordering from a supplier. Orange tags represent males and yellow tags represent females. In addition to color codes, the numbering system is also important for our operation. The numbers correspond with the year the lamb was born and what number lamb it was. For example, ear tag 2150 yellow is the 50th female lamb born in 2021. These ear tags come in two separate parts, male side and female side. 
The male half of the ear tag has a sharp piece that will pierce the tag through the ear. This is the piece I want on the outside of the sheep's ear. The female half of the ear tag has a notch, which I want on the inside of the sheep's ear. When you feel the lamb's ear, you'll notice a big tendon with a vein going down the middle of the ear. I call this a rib. You want to avoid the rib and tag on either side of it. Once each piece of the ear tag is properly in the ear tag applicator, I maneuver the tag so it will be going along the ear once it is locked together. We take birth weights so we can monitor the lamb's growth over time. We use a sling and a cheap digital scale. The front legs of the lamb go through this loop so the strap is on its chest and its belly is supported by the middle of the sling. The two straps then hook onto the scale. Lift the sling high enough so that the lamb's feet are off the ground, but not so high that the lamb could hurt itself if it wiggles out of the sling. The umbilical cord will break naturally from the ewe upon the lamb's delivery. If you are going to cut the umbilical cord, make sure you use doll scissors. Using a 7% iodine solution, we spray or dip the navel area to help keep the area clean from bacteria. We make sure to castrate all males during field processing, when the lambs are less than 24 hours of age. It's very important that the lambs receive some form of tetanus protection prior to castration. This can either be from the used pre-lambing vaccination or a dose of tetanus antitoxin. The elastrator is a very clean and easy tool to use for both castration and tail docking. The elastrator works by cutting off the blood supply to the scrotum or the tail, causing them to wither and drop off. First, place the rubber band on the prongs of the elastrator. Position the lamb so you have clear access to the scrotum and ensure both testicles are in the scrotum. With the prongs of the elastrator towards the lamb's belly, place the rubber band on the scrotum between the testicles and the body. Close the elastrator, check again that both testicles are trapped in the rubber band, and make sure that both nipples are not in the rubber band, and pull the elastrator away. The last part of our field processing is to paint brand the lamb with their use ear tag number. We paint them on both sides using washable, non-toxic, animal-safe spray paint. When we're ready to give the lamb back to the ewe, we take the lamb close to her and place it on the ground, holding its sides to steady it. Once the ewe hears the call, she should come close to us. I will let the lamb go and make sure they are reconnected and recognize each other. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that video all about how we field process our newborn lambs. I know there was a ton of information crammed into a few minutes there. So if you wanna go back and watch it or this entire live stream, they will be available for replay as soon as we're done. That short video you saw is actually part of a larger video we're working on that we hope to release in the next couple of days or coming weeks. And so if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that notification bell, you'll be notified when we publish the full length version of the field processing for our lambs video. So I think that answered one of the questions uh, from William Roberts as far as whether we uh, band or castrate the lambs. And we've got a couple more questions in that we're gonna get to. Um, and then we're going to start talking a little bit about marketing and processing and our livestock guardian dogs before we wrap it up at the end of the hour. So thank you so much for sticking around with us. We hope you're finding value in this content. Please like and subscribe and let your friends know all about Heifer USA's live streams from the field uh, so we can grow this community. Okay, so another question, um, let's see, from Dustin Crystal asked about with castrating, do you need to give any sort of vaccines as well? That's an excellent question. And so um, I think I touched on that in that longer version of the video. But so our ewes are vaccinated 
four weeks prior to lambing with a vaccine that includes C, D, and T. So that T stands for tetanus. And so if that lamb consumes colostrum within that 24 to 36 hours of being born, they're going to have the antibodies and that protection from tetanus. Um, if for some reason you didn't vaccinate your ewes or um, on time or you have a, some other reason, before you castrate, you want to give that lamb a um, tetanus antitoxin. And you can just buy a simple vial of that. You can give that at the same time of castration and that will uh, give protection that way. But if your ewes are, are vaccinated prior to lambing, then you should be good to go. Okay. Awesome. Um, so I think we're good on the questions. If you want to jump into a little bit about the marketing and processing and sure. that, the business side of things. Yeah. Um, so like I said earlier, you know, the breed that you decide to raise is going to depend on what you want to, to do with that sheep. So whether you want for, for wool or milk or meat. Uh, if we do meat here. And so if you are doing it for meat, then you need to think about where you're going to get that lamb processed. And if you want to sell that lamb at a farmer's market, you know, or to your friends and family and things like that, you need to go to a USDA certified processing facility. And then you also need to make sure that that processing facility is willing to process lambs. Um, there's a number of them, you know, you know, they just don't get very many lambs through there. So they may not be um, fully confident in being able to process that lamb for you. So those are good things to check into prior to, you know, scheduling that processing date. Um, and then also remember that when you get your lamb processed, you know, the yield that you get off that carcass is actually going to be really small. Some people don't realize that. There's not all that much meat that comes off of a lamb carcass. And then just pay attention to what cuts you get. You know, if you request certain cuts there may be other cuts that are just unavailable because you know, different parts of that lamb carcass are involved in one cut or the other yeah awesome um and just so folks know if they want to try any of our products i mentioned grassroots yeah. earlier you want to tell folks a little bit about grassroots co-op sure uh so the grassroots farmers cooperative is here in arkansas it was started back in 2015 and so it is a farmers farmer owned cooperative um, and so what the cooperative does is that it allows the farmers to get back to what we really like doing and that's farming. So the grassroots cooperative, they sell all of the meat on an e-commerce platform. So they take care of the marketing and the distribution, um, the scheduling and, and processing and things like that. So they take all the extra stuff off of the hands of the farmer and allow us to, to get back to what we like doing. And so if you wanna check it out, um, they offer 100% grass-fed lamb, 100% grass-fed beef, non-GMO forested pork, and non-GMO pasture-raised poultry. Awesome, yeah, definitely check out Grassroots. Okay, uh, a couple more questions. We'll, let's see, um, hands-on processing classes this year. Will we be able to do any, do you think? I guess that's a question for me. Yeah, I don't um, know. <laughs> so I run our training program and set up uh, all the classes that we do. And right now we're just still in a holding pattern um, in terms of in-person in events until we get uh, approval from you know the organization. And we're, so we're just still kind of waiting. But if you sign up for our email newsletter, and we will drop a link in the description in the live chat right now where you can sign up for our email newsletter if you're not already on it and you can be notified anytime we do anything. So in-person events, new videos, uh, new training opportunities, you name it, we've got it going on. We also have a really amazing residential volunteer program that I, no one asked about, but I'm gonna tell you about because <laughs> it's awesome and more people need to know about it. So if you wanna come here and work here and be involved and learn firsthand and get your hands in the dirt uh, with what's going on with either regenerative agriculture, all of the species that we do here, turkey, uh, pastured poultry, pastured chickens, um, grass finished lambs, cattle, um, and then pigs, forested pigs. We also have a three acre certified organic market garden. So all that is to say that uh, we have a residential volunteer program. You can come here, you can live here, you can volunteer here and learn firsthand. So sign up for the newsletter, check out the link in the description for more information on all of that. And you'll be notified whenever we do our in-person events because we do some really awesome in-person events uh, with some really awesome guest speakers. We travel around, they come here, so you don't want to miss out on those. Um, all right, so 
let's we save the best for last yeah a lot of people when they filled out the registration Oops. wanted to know about livestock guardian dogs and there's a lot to say they're incredibly valuable and i'll turn it over to christine to tell you about all about the livestock guardian dogs before we uh, wrap it up for today's show yes um so livestock guardian dogs like i said we have two here that are assigned to our sheep flock. We have Sam and Uno, um, and they are the hardest working people we have here at the ranch. They are working 24 seven. Right now they are actually both napping on this hillside in the sun, but that's okay because they usually take the nighttime shift. Um, the predators that we deal with a lot would be coyotes and then domestic dogs. Um, we do have like bobcats in the area. We do have foxes here and things like that, but mostly coyotes and domestic dogs. Um, they are Akbash breed, and we bought them from a livestock guardian dog breeder. I believe she was in Tennessee. And so they were already proven guardian dogs. And so that's something you need to think about if you're wanting to get guardian dogs for your farm, make sure you get a guardian dog breed. And so you, it's, it's not really all that great to get a guardian dog breed that is mixed with a, you know, a domestic breed. You want something that is there to work and has working parents and is trained to do what they are doing. And so, like I said, they came trained to sheep. Um, so they were already comfortable around the sheep flock. And it's also important that your animals are used to dogs. And so we have always had livestock guardian dogs here. We used to have Great Pyrenees. We used to have Anatolian Shepherds, and those are both breeds of livestock guardian dogs and then we came upon these two which have been great um, they are like i said they're hard working their job is to go out and bark and protect the sheep if there's anything out of the ordinary whether it's a vehicle or a person or an animal and so they still bark like they were barking at tyler earlier because they just aren't fully comfortable with him yet but if i drive out here then they usually just hang out look at me I will not approach the guardian dogs unless they approach me first. Um, Sam, we can go up and we can give him, you know, a few pets every time we come out here. Uno's a little bit harder. She's the one that needs to approach us. We do want to be able to put our hands on our guardian dogs. We do take them to the vet every year for their annual vaccinations. Um, they get flea and tick prevention and things like that. So um, it's important for us that we can put our hands on them, that they are friendly to us and everything like that. We have so many people out here, so that, that's a very important key for us as well. Awesome. What else? What do you got here? Oh, yes, okay. So with our sheep moving all the time, it's also important that um, we get our dogs dog food and that they have access to it, um, but the sheep do not. And so we have some automatic dog feeders um, we can put 25 pounds of dog food in here and then they can just come up and push this door open and have access to the dog food. So we put this outside of the sheep's pen because the dogs can go through the fences and through the gates and things like that. We don't want the sheep to have access to the dog food. Um, the dogs can be protective over their dog food. So if the sheep come in contact with it, there may be some unpleasant behavior there. But other than that, our guardian dogs have been excellent with the ewes and with the lambs when they're born. Uh, we haven't had any problems whatsoever. Uno actually helped me the other weekend. I was moving our sheep flock to do some roadside grazing along our ditches. And two of the newer lambs, you know, they were a little bit slower. They got left behind for a few minutes, but Uno went and got them and she walked them to be with the rest of our flock. Um, so they're not hurting dogs whatsoever, but she actually proved to be a pretty good one that day. So they're just here to guard our flock. Um, they don't help us with herding or anything like that. Cool, awesome. All right, if you got any more last minute questions, now's the time to get them in. Uh, I'm gonna say hey to a couple of folks real quick. Uh, Josh, thanks so much uh, for your kind compliments about our educational content. I think I saw you comment on one of our other live streams that we did. Uh, I think it was the pig live stream. We do read every comment. We appreciate the community here on YouTube and we try to answer as many of those as we possibly can. So thanks for checking out our videos. Thanks for commenting and joining us here live today. I want to say hey to, um, or was it Odd from France, 2020 volunteer. Hi, Odd. Hey Odd. Hope you're still tuning in with us. Um, so talking about that volunteer program, we get international volunteers as well. Uh, so you meet really great people and you join a really great community. Um, we miss you, Odd. 
And let's see, uh, Pamela Mant Manaton says it's really nice of you to do this live stream. Absolutely, Pamela, anytime. Make sure you tell your friends about it so that they can join us ne next time. Uh, I don't think that many people are doing really high definition live streams in the pasture, Q&A sessions, um, you know, with the animals, regenerative agriculture style. So it's a really unique opportunity and we want more people to know about it and we hope that you can help us spread the good word. Um, and I think that's going to do it for questions and okay. Christine is going to give you a special bonus yes. information now <laughs> and then we're going to sign off. Okay. Thank you for sticking with us this whole time. Like I promised at the beginning, um, I went and I collected all of the material that I reference um, during and, and to help with our sheep enterprise. Um, so the first one would actually be my cell phone. Um, I have a really awesome app on my phone where I can take a picture of a flower or a piece of grass or a tree and it will tell me what it is. And so that helps me with plant ID. You know, if there's something that the sheep just aren't eating, I can take a picture and see what it is and maybe why they don't want to eat it. Um, so being able to identify what types of forages you have in your pasture is a really great idea. Um, I'm also really into this podcast I came across and it is called Sheep Stuff You, E-W-E, should know, pun intended, yes. Um, check it out. There's two seasons of it. It's actually two uh, sheep producers out of California. One um, is on pasture. The other one does um, some feedlot and things. So What's the name of the app? It is, I believe I use PlantNet. PlantNet? Yeah. Cool. All yeah. right. No, Dustin asked about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then if you have animals or if you're just more interested, you know, in animals and working with them, uh, Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals is fantastic. It talks about handling practices, you know, for that are safe and humane and low stress. Um, that is something that we strive to do here every day, you know, to make sure our animals are handled in a low stress way. Um, so this has all the species in it, so definitely check that out. If you go hear her speak, she will sign the book for you. Did you get that one signed? Let me see here. I sure did. All right, Temple that. Grandin. Thank cool. you. That's awesome. <laughs> um, if you are growing hair sheep or more interested in sheep, um, I joined Hair Sheep Times. It's through the Mid-State Hair Sheep Cooperative. Uh, they send out a newsletter every couple of months. So it's pretty cool. This keeps you up to date. It also has some marketing information in there. Um, if you are having issues with predators for any of your species, this encyclopedia of animal predators is super helpful for you to identify what predators are causing issues for you. Um, it's an encyclopedia, so it has so many different options. Um, so check that out. I got that off of Amazon. And then specifically for sheep, um, I also got these two books off of Amazon. So managing your you, um, there's some great information in here and some flow charts to help you kind of figure out what exactly is going on. And then detecting, diagnosing, and treating some land problems. Um, so really learning as much as you can, getting hands-on experience, trial and error um, is how a lot of people learn best. And so having this here to read through and doing some flow charts can help us diagnose and kind of figure out what's going on so it doesn't happen again. Um, so those are great things to have on hand if you have a sheep flock or if you're interested in getting one. Awesome. All right. Hey, Christine, lots of people want to say thank you. I want to say thank you. This has been excellent. I always learn a ton from you and really enjoy these live streams. Uh, so thanks to all of you for joining us today. We hope that you found some value in this video. If you did, go ahead and give it a like and subscribe to our channel and that'll help us do more of this content in the future. Uh, this video will be available for replay as soon as we're done or shortly thereafter. So if you wanna go back and watch anything that you found valuable and might wanna repeat or thought you might've missed, uh, you can check that out. And we'll be releasing a lot more content all about regenerative agriculture and our enterprises here at Heifer Ranch um, and Heifer USA. So I'm Tyler Pearson, that's Christine Hernandez, and we are out of here. Thanks guys so much. Thank you.